It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Wrong or anything. <laughs> but that's what happens. Hey! Hello, it's Wednesday, 1 p.m. East. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, John Nash. We are the Focus Group, and guess what, John? What? I'm wearing a yellow shirt in honor of Brian Roman, who wore yellow last week when he did the LGBT Business Spotlight. And years ago, I, I heard an interview with Katherine Hepburn, and she said, never, ever, ever wear yellow. Because the camera it washes you out and makes you look bad. So I think it looks like I think I got rid of all my yellow stuff. I haven't worn a yellow shirt in probably 15 years, other than that Swingin' Richards T-shirt that we got from, uh, from Alabama. Alabama. But so I found this in my closet, and it was it was probably dry cleaned about 15 years ago from Gap. And I thought, well, I'll put it on. It's a little boxy, but I'm in yellow today. Brian broke. Brian broke the the color barrier. The yellow glass ceiling. You broke the color glass ceiling. I noticed Garrett's got yellow on in the booth. We've got Garrett and John joining us today. Garrett, you're in yellow today. Yeah, this is a, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, strangely, guys, I'm just going to put it this way. Garrett is matching Tim. Right. Which is actually a match because the two of you are, think a lot alike. We're and anti John and I are kind of in our blue our blue shades. And John and I are a little more aligned. Isn't that funny? Well, maybe Garrett could come out and do half the show, and then John could come out and do the <laughs> other half. Either you way, know, we're all looking good. Did you do that sometimes? You guys come on camera one time and do the show? Sure. Yeah, sure. Why not? We we'll could have guests. Places. Us. Yeah, but that, oh, well, listen. <laughs> John would be good back there. I would, other than answering the phone, that's about the, the level of tech I could handle back there with all that. Although I still, guys, Garrett and John, I still remember when Tim was doing Skype from Glenside. And oh I was sitting, in, as Garrett said, I was in the big boy chair. And I was listening to the two of them patiently walk Tim through. Click this, click this. And I was remembering, because last time I helped, I thought I was very patient when no, I No, you weren't. And you had a face. Because I could see when John was walking me through, you were here like this with a face of disgust, like, Phew. Phew. it's not going to work, it's not going to work. I was so aggravated. But then John said, no, just make sure this input's on and that input's on. John said this. John That's all. <laughs> Garrett said this. John said that. Yeah, okay. And then it worked. And it worked. It did. Rather than me getting, and I, I, that's why I often say I feel sorry for poor Bob, John's husband, because he gets disciplined all the time. Yeah, well, he should know better. That's and that's your problem, and Bob, and everybody says that to you. You are such you're very intuitive with tech because you had your own business for so many years. You had to be. So I understand that, but a lot of people didn't. They had to rely on a tech department or something, and you could be very rough. I could be very rough. Okay, I'll have to remember that. And by the way, I think yellow makes you look fat, more tan. <laughs> No, I was going to say, I think it adds, uh, adds more color. And well, it for, does pop in our studio, I think. Yeah, and for me, this these blue shades make me look like I'm not Casper the Friendly Ghost, which uh, with SPF 55, you tend to be. Well, I'll have to wait for Richard and for uh, and my mother and for um, Paul and Mass to chime in and Mark Pipkin down in Rehoboth. They're usually my color. My color. Uh, Your color. My so color uh, we, have, we have Garrett as an oreographer. Right. And they're your colorologists. Colorologists. It's good to have a board of directors around you that know what they're doing, that contribute on a regular basis, Tony. right? So today's my f my favorite kind of show. Not oh, that we don't like folks. Guests, but it's guestless, which it's guestless. means it's a lot more, I think, relaxed. Could I? Um, I wrote I wrote a note down uh -oh. to myself to bring up to you, and I wonder. Here's what I wrote: What does it say about me that I now find new music through ads on TV? Says you're old. <laughs> Does it really? Well, most of the music I hear on TV is old 80s stuff, it sounds like to me, or 90s. So there's an ad for a Hyundai. Hyundai is running some ad, I think, and it's this the car spins around. It's like in a white yeah. room. And either it's a husband, it's either a, a man and a woman, like a couple, or it's a family, depending on the vehicle. But the music they were playing, I was like, I like this catchy. I go online, I type in music for Hyundai, summer sale, whatever, and it takes me to a website that literally lists the, the new the music that's in TV right. ads. And the song that they were playing, or the band they were using, is something called The Knox, K-N-O-C-K-S. And I find the song on YouTube, 
And I realize, of course, that for the Hyundai ad, they're not using any of the explicit lyrics, but they're using the beat Just and the, yeah. sound. And I discover this band, right? And I go to iTunes and I find they have an album out that just came out a little while ago. And I liked, I listened to the samples of most tracks. I was like, I'm going to buy this. Did you buy it? Yeah, I did because I liked it. And what it would cost you nine ninety nine or what? It was actually cheaper. It was five ninety nine, oh, which wow. I was, and it was like thirteen tracks. I was surprised by that. But I thought, you know, there was. A, we've talked about this before. We used to go to the record store and to listen at a listening station. And those filthy air the things at Tower Records. I, when I yeah. think about it now. Yeah. How many, by the time it was 9 o'clock at night, how many people had those on their heads? But, you know, or, you know, you'd go, I remember NME was a was a publication out of, of London that had all the new wave stuff and all the mm -hmm. bands listed and who was coming out with what. Maybe, maybe music has become a little more passive to me, but when I actively want something new, I really feel a little lost. I think the sad part about music now, too, is that if you liked something, then... You could buy the 45, but you essentially would buy the album, album and you got then every, you would discover. Yeah, all the a tracks. lot of times albums were done where you could listen to beginning to end and there was a story and an arc and, yeah. a, and, a, and a crescendo or whatever they call it. But the last album, and it wasn't, an, I guess it was still called an album, but it was a, a CD that I really feel, even if you listen to it now, you'll know where I'm going probably. Annie Lennox's mm -hmm. um, CD that she did her first one, Diva. When you start that, from start to finish, it definitely takes you on a journey, yeah. which is what albums used to do, and you discover other music. But now, if you like something, you just buy one song, and that's it. And so I don't know how some of these other artists, unless they're so big and commercialized, get any sort of steam or play, because if you just like one song, no one's going to discover their other music. You'll just buy the one song. I was thinking of Pink Floyd as well when you said the arc, because yeah. Pink Floyd's another one of those bands that used to there was a story mm -hmm. and some songs were seven or eight minutes long some might have been two uh yellow brick road by elton john's the same thing like you listen to that there's a definite uh... e52's cosmic thing was like that <laughs> that's that's, a, that's such a classic yeah uh, anyway yeah. i just thought it was a funny thing i wrote it down because I, I i i was what's the word chagrined or embarrassed that I had to find a new album to listen to based on a TV ad. Well, the car. last one I found, you know, I did the same thing, but I, I went, there was a Target ad, and of course I forget the name of the they song. They have great now, but music. It was a couple years ago, and I, so what I did is I just hit, when it comes on the TV, I hit the button and I say, Siri, who's playing this song, or what song is this? And then you just hold it to the TV and then she'll tell you. You do that? You can yeah. do that? Guys, I thought that was an app that did that. No, Siri can you do that? just hit Siri, just say, Siri, what, what song is this? And it will say, that is... Rock so, Monster by the b So sometimes there are problems with your Mac that you can't solve, but you do something that I've never... I didn't know you could do that. Well, yeah, I ask it everything. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, I ask it everything. Siri, should I go to the bathroom? Yeah, go. Yes, go now. Right, doesn't it work like that, guys? You could just hit Siri and say, what's I guess so. I always used an app like uh, yeah, John Shazam. Shazam. You don't need Shazam. You don't need any of that. But that's just, awesome. Very cool. Tim, put some music you? on and just say, Siri, what's playing? And she'll tell you, I think this is Magic Carpet Ride by Steppenwolf. You know, done. All righty. All right. I will report back. I'm going to try that out. It's a great, because yeah. I had to go through this convoluted no. thing to get to the song. No, okay. No, no, no. Now, so today we've got two shop talks. They're both uh, involved, I guess. One of them we posted on Facebook. So be sure to follow along with us at focusgroupradio.com on our, on our Facebook. Or you can link to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram there and see pictures and uh, also get articles that we post. But this week we have two shop talks. What was the first one? I love both of them. You found both of them. And we were. this was something we were talking early in the week. The first one came from Time Magazine, and it's why you forget names immediately. So you go to a cocktail party or a business mixer, Chat, 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 chat. Who was that person I was talking to? I do to? it all the time. We all do it. <laughs> and the second one is an article that is actually two articles in one. Um, Tim found this one as well. Things to master before turning 50. But they also had a funny back end of the article, which was things you should have mastered by the time you turn 50. Right, or by the time you're 40, even. You should know they these said. Things, And there, yeah. there were 11, but I added one more at the end. I don't know if you looked at the notes. If you look ahead, you'll see the one that I added, and we'll discuss it then. Because I think they forgot a glaring one. That will be in our book when it comes out. <laughs> Next year. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, so before that, so uh, I talked to my mom this week. You talk to your mom every week. I know, but I talked to her this Sunday. So she watches. Hi, Mom. So she says, I got those, I I got those pistachio <laughs> Oreos. Thins, you know, John yeah. She goes, no, I didn't really like them so much. Your father complained about them, but he's been in them. He's been eating them. <laughs> he's and been then, in them. And then she bought 
the so she's been buying the ones that we've we been having about. on here. So again, another she finally tells me after all this time that she now will buy the Oreos. So I told her, she said, I'm trying to lose weight. I said, don't buy the Oreos. I said, you know, we like them or whatever, but if you're trying to lose weight, you don't want to buy the Oreos. So she had bought the strawberry shortcake ones and, mm -hmm. and a few of the others. And I, I do like the pistachio ones. So I was in the store, and you have one of our listeners, Adrian, is sending us a new flavor. Uh, Rocky Road. Rocky Road. Yeah. So we're not going to try those, but we're going to try Cherry Cola, which um, they smell like Cherry Cola. And, you, and, and here's what Tim did last. Like, Who's been in those? Someone's been in them. You gave these to the guys in the Give booth. Give them to the boys at so. the booth. You can smell the cola as soon as you, you taste it. So the cream. Oh, my God. It really does so smell the cream like cola. Is, so it's supposed to be like a Cherry Cola. So the cream, though, is all of the same flavor. So even though it's a white and red cream. It's just the it's, coloring? It's, it's just coloring. It is one flavor. And they also did like they did with the fireworks Oreos we tried a while back. They put that rock candy in there, the pop candy, to make it pop so it fizzes like soda. The, uh, so this is one of the three flavors. This one, pina colada, and kettle corn are the three that the... the know that the people had sent, the sent consumers in. sent in, and one of them will get picked. You can vote up until, I think it's the end of summer, and they're going to pick one that will get a regular if you let the cookie, rotation. If you let the cookie sit in your mouth a bit, you get the Pop Rocks going. Remember when you were kids? I used to love those Pop Rock things. You know, um... What do you think? Well, it tastes kind of like, I don't know. I, I'm not getting cherry Coke out of this. Maybe it's me. So what's Garrett and John think? The gingerbread cookies. Oh my God, Garrett! Oh wow! They're gingerbread cookies? Garrett, I think right. Garrett's right. Yeah, it tastes just like gingerbread. When if you, you mix ignore it all the up. packaging and you ignore what anybody tells you, the minute he said that, this could be a gingerbread cookie. I, that's weird. Yeah. Our resident, our resident oreographer. See, I like oreologists better. Well, you could be both. The oreographer maps out what's the, the oreos. Between an oreographer and an oreologist. My One. official title. That's the difference. <laughs> Don't you think it'd be like a biologist or a bio like a biologist, right? Oreologist. <laughs> if you want to be an oreologist, go ahead. That's fine. Well, you're an oreographer. Oreographer, yeah. 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 I mean, it's I, a whole I, other field. Yeah, and I think I of, don't know what the, I got to look it up. I think of Garrett as an oreographer. I think he maps out the Oreo like a, like a cartographer. Yeah, the Oreo chain of what's good, what's Here's bad. Here's my problem with this cookie, Mom. Uh -oh. Don't buy them. <laughs> Here's my problem. I think that you know what I think they have to do. That I think Oreo or Mondelez who owns Oreo has to come up with a, the chocolate overpowers. I think the totally, what is supposed to be the cola, and I think if they had an ice cream flavored wafer or something different, it might, then tasted more like. Uh, I wonder if they used the vanilla That's cookie. That's what I was thinking too. Better. You think the chocolate kind of overpowers it? I think. Yeah. I. You know what? I have to agree with Garrett. The minute he said gingerbread, it skewed. And it wasn't that it took much to skew this into, like, if you ignore all this red and all the packaging, it does have a gingerbread taste. Not as spicy as gingerbread, if it's a certain kind of gingerbread, but... And now I hear all the little pop rocks going on in my mouth. It's edible. They're, eat they're edible. That's what Garrett said about the, um, the bites, the coconut, the chocolate coconut. He goes, you know, you, you, you're not going to not eat them. They're, they're perfectly edible, you know. Well, I f it's funny. We, do, we, leave, we, leave the, we leave the cookies here. We come back the following week. They all seem to be gone. There's, so. a, there's a very healthy. Who's the, who's the cookie monster here? Oh, God, there's so many people here. Really? Yeah. 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 Probably 50 people a day come through here, so. Oh, I thought we were the only ones. <laughs> It's nice to think that way, isn't it? We're the only. Hey, hey, our our guys make us think we're the only ones. I know we're it's the nice most, and quiet. We're in here. the most special show. We're told that only like ones you, that matter. You guys, uh, we, how sweet was that? We actually like your show. Yeah, we'll see you. <laughs> so what caught your eye this week, Mister? What Nash? caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Okay, Saturday, this past Saturday, the Tour de France concluded um, with the podium and the presentation in Paris. And actually, Tim has seen. The ending of the Tour de France years ago in Lance mm -hmm. Armstrong Road with the U.S. Postal Team. Funniest thing I've ever seen. You were in the Champs Elysees, mm -hmm. and I now know why you never really saw much of it. They are they're cycling at 30 to 40 miles an hour. That's like a car Loop going by. That and there's a parade. Yes. And I've never seen anything like it in my life. So we know in the United States when there's a parade, a parade <laughs> moves about a mile an hour, right? Oh. This parade goes at about 40 miles an hour. And they've got these 18-wheelers and trucks and stuff with big banners on them. But because they're going so fast, it's like a train. They've got 
three trucks with the same banner, so it would be, you know, send Dender Bank. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the parade, just a stream of trucks going at about 40 miles an hour. So I was uh, uh, reading an article on Business Insider about the mechanics of the Tour de France, meaning, you know, it's we all think of it as the bike race, but it's a massively complex event to put on. I love how you're saying France. France. Yeah, well, I, you know, France. I do speak French. I try. Oh, you do? But I, but, but by the way, um, Alexa only understands me when I say France. Because she's American. Oh, yeah, she's very American. <laughs> so Business Insider had this, this article about the support vehicles that all the teams use um, during the tour. So the first picture um, I think that I have in the deck shows one of these support cars for team EF Drapak, or it's actually it's just Education First as the team, going down the cobbles in Roubaix. So they're following, this is the cars that follow the, the tour. They usually have eight to ten bikes on the roof, coolers uh, with ice in them in the backs, so they're heavy. And then the next picture is the one that actually got me interested. So I'm looking at this profile of a car here, and I thought, oh, that looks like my Volkswagen, my, my last sport wagon, my Jetta sport wagon. And I thought, wow. And then I read, <laughs> and I thought Volkswagen supplying the cars for the tour. Then I thought, then I read, it says, no, this is the car is provided by Skoda, a Czech car maker. And then I read further, a wholly owned subsidiary of Volkswagen, Volkswagen Group. Skoda. It's, and the car is called the Superb uh, model. And actually, they provided over 250 vehicles for the Tour de France. Once the car is purchased, um, because of the tour, and I don't know if you had to do this when you guys were providing vehicles, they raise the suspension, um, and they have to have the car recertified, I think, and then they add a few more things, but basically the raised suspension is to save the car from all the, the bad roads that they have to go on. So, well, and to carry the weight, too. And to carry the weight of the bicycle. So then they had a slideshow of some of the, uh, of the cars, and they showed a truck, actually, that carries for this team so if you're watching on the video, we're, we're, uh, I'll describe it if you're listening to us on um, our podcast. It's the back of a, like a, uh, a small 16-wheeler or something, I guess, like a, a, a truck. Probably a Skoda. Probably a Skoda utility Skoda truck. truck. And hanging inside the truck are no less than 20 bikes because each team in the Tour de France has eight riders, and I'm, I think each rider has two to three bikes assigned to them. So basically you're looking at... Um, Forty or 50,000 worth of carbon frame bikes, about 10,000 worth of tubes and, and tires, and it's just huge, massive things. So that was that was one thing that caught my eye was the uh, Tour de France. And, and how I, should, did, I should have taken, I had a picture of me in front of a Skoda you? truck, which I should have. Was it branded for the? Uh, well, so I was in Finland, and it was for the racing team. So Subaru had a racing team, a rally car racing team. For, just cars, for not cars. Bikes, yeah. And the Skoda truck... Rob Moran and I were there laughing our butts off because the, it was in English. And so the truck was called the Magical Pony Fun Box. <laughs> and <laughs> Skoda. You're not. No, it was the Magical Pony Fun Box. And it was a truck just like the utility truck loaded with gear for the racing The team. Magical Pony, Pony Fun, Fun Box. Box. It was a utility truck. Oh, my God. Okay. Which is even funnier because usually you find those sort of names coming out of Japan. But coming out of the Czech Republic, I guess, it was a Skoda with a Skoda. Magical Pony so, fun box. I'll take three of them. So this ended up in a weird way. This this tour vehicle thing kind of was a VW nod because I didn't realize that Skoda until I saw until I read the connection. I was like, oh, yeah. And this other quick one that caught my eye is a very simple, quick one. And the headline simply reads, here's why you shouldn't leave a giant parabolic mirror in your car on a sunny day. So a guy that works at the Explore, Exploratorium in San Francisco um, had a dish, one of those dish TV network things. Right. He was going to turn it into a parabolic mirror. It already had a mylar coating on it. He left it in the back of his car. What's a parabolic mirror? A parabolic mirror is just like a it's curve, a like a dish. Or, okay. Like a dish. So it focuses the rays of the sun to a central point from the outer edges. What would you do with it? Do you know? He was going to use it to teach kids that you could actually use the power of the sun to, like, light a campfire or heat water or something. But he left it in the car by accident. <laughs> he only realized when he came out later that the sun's rays had um, hit the mirror and bounced up to the top, and it melted the plastic cladding around the inside of the hatchback and, and the car. I think it was about $150 in wow. damage to replace. But he said had it been actually resurfaced with m more shiny material than it was, it could have caused much more damage because the, the intensity of the sun, when it's focused to a central beam, is almost well, like... By the look of that car, to let it go. 
<laughs> to burn up and yeah, get a new one. By the way, I think it's an old Outback Sport. Well, the, the grade of plastic then was about a notch above a paper towel. <laughs> so it wouldn't have survived wouldn't anyway, have survived. right? I'd have let it burn. Okay, so that's what caught my eye. <laughs> Mine is very different. Naturally. I know. I'll have to ask the boys in the booth of this, because you'll probably be embarrassed. The headline is, Summer's in full swing, and so too, apparently, is a phenomenon called summer penis. Oh, I read heard of summer this, penis? Yeah. Oh, they're nodding. Never. No, oh, never. Haven't not. heard of it, no. but you know what? Sounds like a nice uh, little uh, surprise. Yeah, not until this week. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a nice You're little surprise. Group? Yeah, who would, who would not like a little summer penis? So it says summer penis is real. Doctors agree that the heat may make men's penises appear larger in the summer. So there's a whole study that was done, and Richard sent me this, and then I went and I thought, well, maybe it's a joke, and I looked, and no, in fact, no, there was real. this whole, whole thing done. Now, if you're watching along with us, there's a famous ad that was done probably 10 years ago from the Banana Republic catalog. Yeah, well, I, do you remember this? I do. And there was somebody, if you look at it, you can decide whether you think it was done on purpose or the, the graphic. If you were running the graphics, John, you might have just left it in and see what happens, right? <laughs> he's got nothing to complain about, or he's happy on set, or the, the stylist did something. So I mean. apparently they said it's a temporary fluctuation that, thanks to heat and warmth, gives you a month's leg up on your, your manly you know, shaft size. And they said it would be the equivalent of if a woman's boob suddenly got huge from May to August. <laughs> now you boys would like that. Like Garrett's nani. Yeah. yeah, of course. I wish it was longer. That's yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> extend that whole period. That's what she said. We're talking about the boobs. <laughs> Come on, greenhouse effect. <laughs> Come on, greenhouse effect. So they talked to a bunch of ure urologists, not oreologists, but urologists to find out what the heck's going on here. And they said, in fact, that half, a lot of it has to do with the heat. And we all remember the famous Seinfeld episode where... The, the, oh, the shrinkage. The shrinkage. It's shrinkage. And George so, in the pool. Right, and they said it also has to do with how much water you drink in the summer as well mm -hmm. because it could bloat you with the heat and the sun or whatever. So they essentially said that, in fact, although it gives the illusion that you may feel as if um, you're, a little, you're, you're a little more um, larger, that it really just is an illusion and that eventually it just goes back to whatever size you are. <laughs> but they said the heat can definitely – well, we know that, right? The heat's going to – make you feel a little more loose than, than the cold. Yeah. I don't have to get into the science of Did it. Did they say how much bigger it gets? Well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Did they actually have a... Uh, it says when, they, when it gets hotter, the blood pumps more, and as a result, you appear to be bigger than you actually are. And they said, so... Um, and that's flaccid. Right. So they said it's purely a function of how much blood is circulating within the penis, and if it's warm out, it dilates, and it appears to get bigger. It doesn't say how much bigger, though. Hmm. Mm. You'll have to let us know. Maybe this. You see Garrett going in for the critical question <laughs> that might even debunk that whole thing, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they give a whole, whole list of long explanations, which we don't need to do, but we just know that sometimes there's shrinkage, sometimes there's not in the heat. Some, sometimes there's shrinkage, longer. sometimes there's expansion. Expansion. It's like expansion the, happens in the heat, which happens in the summer. Yeah, it's like the joints of a bridge. Yes. They have those things that expand and contract. Okay. Now, the other thing I found, which is a quick one, and I, do you know what's happening this weekend? Mm. It's a global event, a big global event. It's happened for the last 32 years. This is the 10th edition. Not Earth Day? No. I'm afraid. Why? That's why it caught my eye. So we should all know this. Listeners, maybe, maybe the listeners <laughs> That's know. why it caught my eye, because we should all know this. This just yeah. popped across my feed, and I thought, I thought, God, I haven't heard a thing about it, nor do I know anything about it, and usually it's on our radar. From August 4th through August 12th, 2018, Paris will host the 10th edition of the oh. Gay Games. It's the largest sporting and cultural festivity or festival for LGBT athletes. It's held every four years for the past 32 years. Hey, wait, There's over 10,000 participants from 80 countries, more than 36 sports and 14 cultural events. It's taking place in Paris and venues throughout Paris. And as I said, teams representing 80 countries. The United States is sending a big contingent, I guess. But four years ago, it was in Cleveland. Cleveland, right. And then I thought the next city was not... Was it Paris? It's Paris this weekend. It starts this weekend. And it, I haven't heard a thing about it. And so I went on. There's, there are pictures. There are things. There's, there, but I thought for, talk about a bad, I don't know, bad press or bad PR or they're just not getting the word out. Do you know anyone who's going or anyone who's participating? No. 
No and no and no. And and you're correct in that when the games were here in Cleveland, I know that was one huge thing of our one of our listeners, Jay, was Jay involved. Jay and some of the other people out of Cleveland. They, yeah. they were very, very aware of getting the word out to get the athletes, to yeah. get the athletes' families and friends to come observe, you know, to watch the event. So that that really is actually like talk, talk about caught your eye. Yeah. Because it surprised you because I haven't heard a thing. I haven't heard a thing about it. And that's why I thought it was interesting because it just seemed seemed wow. like it came out of the okay. blue. And I was like, wow, we don't know anything out of the about blue, it. Yeah. yeah. So that that's what caught my eye. Business birthday this week. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings. But the focus group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Happy 78th to Henry Silverman. Do you know Henry Silverman, John? No. I didn't either. <laughs> I'm glad we're on the same today, page there. <laughs> born August 1st, an American entrepreneur and private equity investor. He's best known for his role in building the Sendin Corporation into a multi-billion dollar business services company that provided rental cars, travel reservation services, as well as real estate brokerage, and was also the largest franchisor of hotels globally. So he's uh, celebrating his 78th birthday today. He lives here in Manhattan. Among the brands that he controlled included hotels and motels such as uh, America, America Host Inns, Days Inn, Howard Johnson's, Ramada, Super 8, Travel Lodge, all the, all the biggies. You know, you, you, you take care of the poor, you live with the rich. And uh, what was the, uh, yes, you feed the poor. And here he's taking care of the poor at all these, <laughs> these no tell motels. Rich, yeah. He also owned car rental operators such as Avis and Budget. And uh, so if you look at there, there's a slide of some of the companies he controls are controlled. Real estate brokerage, Caldwell Banker, Century 21, Sotheby's, which doesn't seem to fit, and Actually, Orbitz. Tim, that is the ringer of that brand list that just doesn't seem. Sotheby's. Yeah. What, it's, like that, it's like that Highlights magazine. What thing doesn't belong in this picture? Probably a girlfriend told him to buy it or something, or he had to do it just to shut, shut up one of the, the investors or something. Remind me of our friends up at L.L. Bean. They said the, the the second wife would often show up at a New York shopping trip with a Gucci bag and say, can you make this? It'd be like, it's, <laughs> it's L.L. Bean. Off brand. Yeah, it's L.L. Bean. Off. We're not, making, we'll we're not making Gucci bags. So um, so he left in 2000, uh, 2009. He left Sendent and started something or was chief operating officer of Apollo Global, which was also a private equity firm. And then 2012, Guggenheim and Partners. And now he's with some place called 54 Morgan. He was married three times. So he went to Williams College, and then he went to Penn, and so he's, he's a scholar. I laughed at this. So he married, he divorced his second wife and married his yoga instructor within 40 days, 30 years younger. This picture you found. Yeah. So if you're listening, uh, there's a photo of him in the middle, the, the, the guy that Tim's profiling. The new wife is on the left. The old wife is on the right. right. Nancy's on the right. And if you want any pictorial representation of the midlife crisis, it's right there. So Nancy's on the right. She's the second wife. This is a little bit like Donald Trump. She's the second wife. She's the second okay. wife. And the the, yo, the former yoga instructor, her name's Karen. She's on the, and she's, as I said, 30 years as junior. And she. 30 years. She's the third wife. So second wife, Nancy, during the divorce, no dumb cookie, she was. She received. <laughs> no Nancy, dumb cookie, she was. Nancy received $150 million. Oh. As well as the Upper East Side apartment and the home in Southampton. <laughs> dumb as a fox, right? So Silverman wow. tried to argue that he was an innate genius. Where have we heard that before? Mm. From the, uh, the POTUS, perhaps? Yeah. He, so he was in court arguing during the divorce that he was an innate genius, and his wife Nancy played no part in any of his earnings of the $450 million fortune. The acquisition. They had massed well together. Well, of course, the court didn't agree, and all Nan walked away with 150 mil, the Upper East Side apartment, as well as the place out in the Hamptons. And she now has the money to buy, to hire any kind of pool boy talent she desires, right? Yeah. Happy, birth would... Happy birthday, Henry. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Hey, so everyone knows that uh, Deep Discount is a friend of ours here in the Focus Group. Go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo and start shopping away. They always have some great sales. There's a sale this – what's the sale this week, John? Okay, we are allowed to pick some of the sales. And so, right. uh, they, so they're, they're running pick? about nine sales, which are all great. But we picked the British sale. And before I forget, uh, Deep Discount lets us do this once or twice a year – 
fill up the basket, folks. They're giving us a code for all of you listeners and watchers. And the code is FG15. It's a one-time use only code. It's good for everything on the site except games and game consoles and game accessories. And it can't be used with other coupons. But if the prices are already great, so you fill up your basket, use FG15, you'll get 15% off. And you'll probably get free shipping. So, so fifteen percent off the already great price. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. So we picked the British sale, and the title that I would like to introduce people to is: if you're a fan of the House of Cards, the American version of the show, you need to know that House of Cards actually began on the BBC years before it was ever made here, and it was fantastic. It stars Ian Richardson, a great British actor, as the Tory Chief Whip Francis Urquhart. And it follows his arc to ultimate power, and it involves murder and anything that stands in his way. It gets dealt with for him to become. Was it spacey in that? That's in the American version. So you're you're doing the British. Yeah, the British version, which aired many many years before right. it was made into an American show, is worth watching. It's really well done. Same setup as the American. He the main the central character sometimes turns and breaks the fourth wall and talks directly to the camera, like I'm gonna watch what I'm gonna do to this this guy, I'm gonna get him out of the parliament or something. But it's typical British and the parliamentary scenes are what we are actually used to watching where they're at they're at each other all the time and laughing and the whole bit. But it's called House of Cards Trilogy on Blu ray at deep discount. And I picked something that I think John got his all spun up about, but in a good way. I, in a good way. But I picked uh, I Claudius. Which I know for many of you is probably off-brand for me. So I <laughs> thank you for setting me up because I saw this. Did you piss? And I was like, "What? <laughs> Tim picked I Claudius." <laughs> So what? All right, it's I winner, love it. winner of an Emmy and numerous other awards. It's a riveting tale of ambition, debauchery, intrigue. Remains one of the most popular and acclaimed dramas in the masterpiece uh, theater history. It was also one of the top novels of the 20th century, as well as rated one of the 100 best TV shows of all time by Time Magazine. And uh, so it was done by the BBC and Masterpiece Theater. It comes in DVD. There's actually five DVDs because that's how long the series is. And you get the whole series for. Under forty bucks, it's thirty-seven ninety-nine. Retail price is sixty or higher, depending on. You can't find this online look. or on streaming no. either, so that's why you have to buy it. No, so it's it's uh, it, it originally came out in nineteen seventy-six. There is rumor that HBO had bought the rights and they're going to try to do a remake. This is another one, though. I'm not sure you can. Why bother? Yeah, Derek Jacobi plays I Claudius. Or Claudius the Emperor, and it, I Claudius the series is a combination of. And the book you mentioned is by Peter Graves. Yep. I Claudius, and his second book was called Claudius the God, and I believe these the two books make up this series. It, w I was stunned, and look at the smile, the Cheshire. Did you crack, laugh? The che I did because I, <laughs> in fact. It was last night. I was in my office, and I walked out. I said, you're not going to believe what Tim... And I said did you this... tell Bob? What did he do? Did he and, laugh? And Bob goes, he goes, I, Claudius. He goes, wouldn't that put him to sleep? I was, <laughs> yes. It's a talky drama. Well, you know what? It's, there's a few of these things that I like. There was another thing I was going to pick, but I didn't pick it for one reason. It was a compilation. Yeah. And it had The English Patient in it, which I do think was a horrible film. I hate that movie. Sorry, folks. I do, too. <laughs> so I didn't pick that one. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to pick I, Claudius. I had to read the book in college. I liked it. It's a great book. And it was a great discussion book to have as a in college. And so it brought back a memory to me. I laughed because I knew you were going to be like, what the I love getting set doing? up. So what is the release this week? It's called Tully, which I don't really know much about. And, um, it stars Charlize Theron. I, right. And I was reading about it, but I, I, I read into the description because the description kind of leaves you hanging. That's my thought, too, because I had not heard of the movie, actually. And it says that um, it sounds like there's a um, housewife who is very busy, your husband, and there's lots going on she's, in the house. She's almost 40. She's got a household to take care of. A new baby arrived, right? Right. And wealthy brother says you need to get a nanny. He decides he's going to pay for it. Pay for it, yeah. And then it says um, things don't necessarily turn out the way you'd think. And in the door comes attentive and, and intuitive and young Tully, played by Mackenzie Davis. And then it says the ways in which this perfect helpmate proves too good to be true fuels this acerbic effort from Theron's young adult collaborators. Uh, so I was wondering if maybe the nanny has a relationship with the husband. Well, you know, when it says happened. when it says it proves too, too good to be true, I think, oh, my God, the hand that rocks the cradle, like some you crazy. You guys know about this movie? 
Oh, totally. First I'm hearing about it. Yeah. It's, it'd be interesting to see because it left me wondering. So but, maybe, then, but then when you put the word acerbic in, that means there's humor somehow in here. Am I, am I reading that right, guys? I mean, it's, it's like an acerbic wit is someone who's like, you know, cutting or sarcastic or whatever. Well, we'll have to watch it. Uh, I think this is one of those movies you do buy because it's uh, not on the radar and it would be fun. So to recap for everybody, we have a special code for you this month direct from our friends at Deep Discount. It's FG15. If you use it when you fill your cart, you'll get 15% off. It's one time only. And it's for good for everything except games, game consoles, and accessories. Can't be used with other codes. But remember, you often get free shipping from Deep Discount. So go shop away. Click on their logo at our site, focusgroupradio.com. I picked the House of Cards trilogy, which is a BBC show because it's the British sale. Tim picked... I, Claudius. <laughs> and the release this week is Tully. What do we say, Garrett? Thanks, Deep Discount. All right, we're going to take a super quick break, and when we return, we have an article that Tim found that I really like called Why You Forget Names Immediately, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. <laughs> hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, John Nash. Thanks for uh, watching us live here today. And uh, most of you, we know, time shifts, so... Um, we release the audio version of our show on Saturday mornings to keep those of you who are familiar with our show from just an audio. Just a simple old call-in, a Saturday call-in show with games of chance. and. But it's amazing Saturday. how much the audio still is strong. And so thank you, everybody, for who tunes in and, uh, and takes us along with you on the weekends for the audio, audio version Don't of the show. Don't forget Unbuttoned. Well, tell them. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for downloading Unbuttoned, our Tuesday podcast. Three topics we usually tackle. We try to keep it fun. Sometimes it shifts a little political. Sometimes it's not. Depends, yeah. It depends on the week. And you depends know, on what we find. It depends on what we find. It's almost a modified caught my eye or something, I guess. So, as teased at the top of the, uh, before the break, why you forget names immediately and how to remember them. An article from Time Magazine that Tim found um, and I'll kick it off by saying, of all the social gaffes, none is perhaps more common than meeting a new person, exchanging names, and promptly forgetting them, which I have a great memory, but in some situations that goes right in one ear and out the other. <laughs> I do that. all. I forget all the time, and th this tells you that th I loved I loved the first explanation. My favorite, yeah. Because it says the simplest, expla simplest explanation for you forgetting the name is you're just not interested. <laughs> And I thought, I was at a gathering this past weekend, and I knew I would never see these people again. Yeah. And six people came in, and they wanted to all introduce themselves. Hi, 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 hi. You know, shake your hand, shake your hand, here's their name. I, I knew I'd never see them again, not interested in their names. We exchanged names. I'm sure they forgot me. I forgot them. But there are times where you do want to remember the name. You're better, better at it than mm -hmm. I am because you can tend to put a face with a name better than I can. Marginally better with this, yeah. But they said that there's, um, it happens to everybody, and there are some simple tricks to try to figure out how not to um, forget names. And do you have one of your own that wasn't here? A trick? Yeah, because you told me the way you remember names. I try to make it connect to another word. Um, is that what you're talking about? Or you like also said you repeat it. Well, three times at least, yeah. Uh, so if someone says, hi, I'm Tim, you'll look at me and say, Tim, Tim, Tim. Tim. yeah. And that, to yourself? Yeah, to myself. Does that help? And that does help, yeah. And I also fall back on my old rule of thumb, which is I don't have any shame in walking up to someone saying, I'm allowed three, three, uh, three ups at bat. I already hit strike one. What's your name again? <laughs> and it usually elicits a laugh. Oh, okay, it's okay. My name is Dave or whatever it is. But... I was told years ago that that's a socially acceptable thing, that if you, if you forget someone's name by the th after the third time, now you're looking like... You really don't care. You really, really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way with you. I'm, I've never been embarrassed to say, I'm sorry, what was yeah. your name again? Yeah. And nobody... Say, oh, it was Jennifer or it was you know, George or whatever it was. But I, um, I forget, I do forget, and they said that 
some other ways is to make an association. So they use the example here of John. And if you met somebody named John and you remember that he was a runner, maybe say, okay, John Jogger, John the Jogger. Yeah, exactly. Do that exactly. sort of thing. And I've, I did, I've tried to do this with friends, and I, some of them I'm successful with and some I am not. Um, with trying to associate a name or giving mm -hmm. them a nickname in my mind, particularly in all, all the new neighbors that I'm meeting in um, Rehoboth. In Rehoboth. And, and it's been successful in some and not so much with others. Not so much in others. They did recommend another technique for remembering, and it was um, trying to remember the moment you met the person. This was. This felt a little difficult to me because it says, and if you do forget, envision the moment you met somebody. Well, it could be chaotic. There could be a lot of people around. But I've tried to do that with other things that I, if I forget something, I try to remember the moment that I got the piece of information that I need. It usually comes back hours after I need it. <laughs> like I'll be sitting and, oh, that's the name of the person. Sorry, I totally forgot about that. But um they didn't. I thought these techniques for remembering. The only one that really struck me was this association thing. It was association. Yeah. There was repetition. There was the trying to um, a facial feature, perhaps with a with a name, and then I, I I remembered when I was going back to my corporate days, and people would hand out business cards and then give a presentation, and everybody would meet and greet and say hello, and you hand your cards out. But what I would then do is I always laid the cards out in front of me if they were giving a presentation in the order the people were standing. Oh, that's smart. You mean so the business cards? You yeah, had the business, business cards. cards. So if there were five or six people from an agency, for instance, that came mm -hmm. in, and there's I didn't know everybody. Team. Right, yeah. and there's a team. You just put all the cards down. It's a, Ann, Bill, John, George, whatever. Very clever. I like that one. But I, other than that, though, I think it's difficult. Um, what, what I've started to do is I will... If I meet somebody, I try to keep it in my head, and as soon as I get home, I write it down. And I put it in the because of the neighbors. I put yeah. it in I put it in the inside of the cabinet. I do have a funny story. When I was in college, we had three cooks in the kitchen. At your the frat house. At my frat house. And they were they were mid elder elderly women, I would say, probably in their sixties, seventies. And people would come back that were gone for ten years or fifteen and they would oh, hi oh hi hi Nathan. Hi George. Hi whatever. And I was like, wow. And it was uh, Marva and Garnet and and, um, and uh, Wilda. And I would say, how do you remember everybody's names? Did they tell you? And so they were like, oh, we just have a good memory. We have a good memory. And then I, I could never figure out. They would know anyone who came through the door. And I didn't know the names. So then finally. Um, I'm, almost if, I'm almost wondering if there's a book of pictures or something. Garnet finally okay. showed me what she had. So on the inside of all the kitchen cupboards, they had all the composites each year. Of everybody. So somebody would come in, they'd be like, oh, class of 85. <laughs> and then they'd close the kit. Hi, John. How are you? How's everything? They had everyone everyone on the, it was smart. That reminds me of my, one of my favorite movies, The Devil Wears Prada, where the two assistants go with Miranda Priestley to this event. And their sole job is to memorize pictures of people so that when someone comes up to Miranda, she's like, oh, it's Ambassador so-and-so and your lovely, do your lovely wife, how are you doing? Because how could she remember all those names, right? <laughs> oh, my God. You there, know, was, there was one time when it did backfire. I, I followed a guy named Tom Donnelly, who is now one of the senior people at Mazda Motor Company. And he had, I followed him into a territory in Minnesota, and he gave me his phone list. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to remember everybody. He goes, oh, I've, I'll give you my phone list. It's got everybody's name. And I got a little something about them next to each oh, I name. I love this. Love this story. So this one guy out of a dealer, I won't mention his name, but he was at a dealer in central Minnesota. He had next to his name Dickhead. <laughs> the guy, <laughs> because the guy really, and it, and it fit. The yeah. guy was so. One day I'm there visiting the dealer, and he's like, "I need to call so and so. Do you have your phone list?" And I was, I and I was, I knew his you name. Know. I said, "No." And he grabs it out of my hand, <laughs> and then he looks at it. What, 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 what's this next to my name? And I said, "Oh, I don't know. Somebody must have written that in there. This is an old. Oh, this isn't my phone list." <laughs> I said, this must be from the other. I said, I don't know. I got my phone list mixed up with somebody else's. Were you red? red as oh, my God. I was mortified. And then I learned to never do that again. I, I, I would go make a copy and white out all the. It would have been funnier if he actually 
kind of cocked his head and said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> then he would have acknowledged, right, that there was something going on there. I To end the name thing, I was uh, weeks ago I was on a training ride on my bike, and I rode, a guy rides up next to me. He goes, how far are you going on this road? I said, I'm going up to Piermont. Oh, I'll ride with you. We ride along. I learned that he was a retired MTA worker, drove this inspection train, like... So, and I got his name, and he said his name a couple times. So, fast forward to just last week. I'm on the same road. I'm doing a training ride, and this guy rides up next to me and goes, Hey, John, how you doing? Uh oh Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I have no idea. what I said, we're riding. I said, look, I said, I know that you sent your son to Tulane. I know that you drove the inspection train. You retired recently. You live on, you live on 100 and something street. I said... But amazingly, I don't remember your name. And he bust out laughing. He says, you remember everything else but the name? And I said, yeah, I don't know why. What's his name? I don't remember. <laughs> did he give you his name again? He so did. Now you only got one more bat. I one got more one chance more at bat. I'm, I'm, I'm three strikes. So what you should now do is write it down when you get home. Yeah, three strikes and I am going to be out, man. That's be totally funny. out. But he remembered your name. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I I should ask him why, but I, I almost don't want to know. Maybe Maybe... I don't know. Why did I remember your name? Anyway, that was uh, Tim's article on why you forget wow. names immediately, and I just proven that I do, in fact, forget them quite quickly. But I'll remember. I'm I'll, surprised that's not like you. But I'll remember when you your first kid was born, even if I don't know your name. <laughs> How about the time you went up to somebody at one of those IGLTA events and you're like, hi, you had a whole conversation with this guy that was from one of the hotel groups or something yeah. or an airline. He had no idea who you were. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, I do. You're remember. like, no, we had this conversation about, I'm like, John, just let's move on. I, I should have taken your advice because it was. <laughs> you kept trying to convince him that you had met. He's like, no, we haven't met. Great advice. Like, no, we spent a lot of time together talking in Spain. We were in the lobby. You're going through the whole thing. The guy had no, what? what? I'm like, John, move on. It could on. have been an act. He, he could have also just hated me and wanted me out of his face. <laughs> That, that might, hey, let's go with B. That might be better. All right, we're going to take a super quick break. And when we come back, uh, the article we're tackling and the topic is things to master before turning 50. So stay with us and we'll be right back. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money and I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Rocher. Yeah. He is doing well. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. We're guestless. Guestless. As opposed to topless well, this week. Speaking of topless, look what our friends at Deep Discounts. What did you get? Shatterbox. I got one too. I can't wait to watch it. That's the one with the speaking talking vagina. Part. The talking, talking vagina. vagina. That's a science word. We can use that word. Okay. Talking um, vagina. <laughs> You're all excited about. You're gonna watch that this weekend. I'm gonna definitely you know, watch. Bob's it, family's yeah. gonna be in. That'd be a nice thing. Watch to put that on. thing with John's with Bob's mom and sister. There's there's Your a family mom. event for you. Family event. Hey, everybody. I'll Let's bring mine home for Thanksgiving. Gather around the TV for a great movie <laughs> called Chatterbox. All right. So this other shop talk that we found, this came from The Ladders, which is a career uh, career website. And this popped in because I thought it, it um, I, I thought it hit close to home, and I was curious about what the things were. So the title was Things to Master Before Turning 50. And they said it's not things like, oh, I want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which would, would be cool, but it's more things that would center you or things you should have learned along the way, particularly within your career. And uh, the line they used, it's about becoming the happiest, healthiest, all around best person you could be. So they put together this list of things you should master by the time your 50th birthday rolls around. And then at the back end, there's a list of things that we should have already learned by the time we're 40. And I, I agreed with, with most, I yep, guess. So what was, the, what was the first one, John? First one is called mentoring, being a mentor for someone. And I think this creeps up in your later years in your career in a positive way when uh, you meet with somebody, a, younger, a young professional who might know your work or wants your opinion, your input. And uh, it's a really cool way of giving back. Um, I've mentored a number of people, and I'm happy to say that it's it's a very it's a great thing. It's rewarding. It's very rewarding. Right. Perfect word, Tim. Perfect. The, the the second thing was apologizing, and they said apologizing is not something that comes naturally um, to everyone. But they said that the steps for a successful apology, particularly in the workplace, are showing up in person, explaining what happened, and how you're going to avoid the problem in the future. Actually, saying you're sorry 
and then making restitution if need be. Apologizing is a tough one because a lot of people do feel sometimes they might be weak if they do it or that it, it, um, it's surrendering. But I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think it's correct. I think people should learn how to apologize. You do something wrong. It, what was the old Lonnie Davis thing? Tell it all, tell it early, tell it tell yourself. yourself. Yeah, that was the PR line. The PR line. For apologizing, I remember once when I was young, like first starting out in business, um, and I was a freelancer, and I messed something up. It was, I, I, it was my fault. And I apologized to the client. And as I was apologizing, she, she holds up her finger, and she said, you were perfect until you used a conjunction. And the conjunction was but. Oh. I am sorry, sorry but. but. And I did it again, like, because I used and or something like that. And, and she just, finally, she was just like, you know, get rid of all that. It was a mistake. You're sorry. Move on. But I don't need all the... Yeah, I'm sorry this but I was late and exactly. this happened and that happened. So you're making excuses. So I think it just... was like I was 24 when I learned that and I've never forgotten it. And I, when I apologize, I purposely remember never to never to say that kind of thing because that's not an apology then, right? Yeah. What's, I, the, what's the third one? I highly recommend this and I think it's an important one. And it's something you should, in fact, master by the time you're 50. And that's spending time alone. Um, I, it, it suffice to say that how they put it is alone time allows you to process and regulate all your complex emotion. Plus, it affords the opportunity to do what Newport, this uh, uh, scientist says, calls deep work, the kind that requires deep concentration and focus. I've had afternoons or if my schedule is clear or if I'm able to just take two or three hours, I'll leave the apartment or the office and walk to a park and sit with my notebook or just listen to music. And it's amazing even if you're just by yourself for two or three hours what you're able to accomplish mentally. It's a cleansing for me at least. Um, I was wondering if it was uh, similar to meditation when some people meditate in the morning. But it, it like, sounds different than that, though. I think so. I think meditation is more directed, and you choose to do that, but and and for good reason. But I think being alone is is a very important thing. The uh, the fourth one was detecting a lie, and they said, you know, it would be great to be able to, at an early age or an early time, be able to detect, you know, BS um, as it comes along. I I've always I think been pretty good about oh, this. Oh, you have a terrific BS um, meter, man. You are if, right. <laughs> which is almost too dangerous at times, but they said it'd be good to know if, or if you could tell somebody's lying or whatever. I, I think it's, do you not know who you are sitting next to? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we both can pretty quickly suss out. Yeah. yeah. You and I were on a panel once, and immediately we realized it was BS. And mm -hmm. which, of course, we have a great mentor of, of somebody in research that told us he, at the end of the, that was his whole line at the end of the day. He says, you know, at the end of the day, it's all, all BS. Bullshit, it's yeah. all bullshit. So what's number five? Tempering your relationship expectations. Um, and uh, it basically, it's simply this. Romance or not, depend. You, you, we read into a lot of things. We project into our relationships what we want them to be, what we hope them to be. And it's not all Hollywood. If it's a romantic thing, it's not all twinkling stars and let's turn off the, the bedside table and we're going to, you know, sleep our way our problems. As Dr. Ruth Westheimer says, who, by the way, is a neighbor of mine now. She lives, I, thought, she lives I saw that. I, I'm that. dying to run into her. She lives across the street. Probably in a wheelchair, isn't she? She's got to be in her or late jazzy, 80s, early 90s, jazzy right? Jazzy or jazzy. Yeah, she's, um, she basically says, you know, don't have unrealistic expectations, and life is not like a candy store. You got to, you, sometimes you have to work at these things. And what was the final line I think she said, which I thought was really cool about hope? It's oh. important to be realistic, but still have hope. Yeah, her philosophy. Yeah, well, it's important to be realistic, but to still have hope. hope. Yeah. <laughs> in the middle of our list of mastering these things by the time you're 50, this is for life and for work, of course. Number six is managing stress, and that's a simple one. You know, learn how to handle the things that you can handle, and uh, in terms of what you can control, and. Um, other times, there's so many things that come into your life that are stressful that you can't, you don't have any control over. So you need to know how to manage that and manage stress overall. So I think that's a so lesson hopefully everybody's learned. Did you like the examples 50. they gave? Uh, so Bill Gates reads before bed, Warren Buffett plays the ukulele, and Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook turns her phone off. Turns her phone off. And yeah. what do you do? You go ride your bike? For stress management? Yeah, uh, cycling, most yeah, certainly. People, people might go out for a run. They might go to the gym. Yeah. They might... 
sit down with a cup of tea. Who knows? But everyone has their own thing to manage stress. You know, throwing on an episode of Ab Fab or Little Britain does the job, too. Because yeah. <laughs> you laugh away your problems, right? What was number seven? Next one is uh, speaking up for yourself, an essential skill for any adult. Um, and basically, I think when we look at this speaking up for yourself, I saw this was a slight, I put a question mark here because it was a little confusing to me because they put it, they addressed it completely in the business realm. Was mm -hmm. that your takeaway too? Yeah. Um, and so uh, the, some of the advice they gave actually to me meant more like building teams and allies than, than speaking up for yourself. I, I just think in general, being assertive and polite and smart in how you present yourself and your facts, or if you're making a case, how you present your case is an important skill. Um, does that how you took, I mean, that's my yeah, You're right, away. because they, they, there was a professor from Columbia, the Columbia Business School, Adam Galansky, who put this in very much a business term of um, trying to assess what others want, then ask for advice, show your yeah. passion, whatever. But the, I think the you're right in your assessment of this that that's more pertinent is to be able to speak for yourself. And, and by the way, I, I, people like assertive people. They don't like rude people, but they like when you have a point, when you're not rude and you're assertive and you are accepting of other opinions. But it's if a, you have an opinion that you can support, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, people might not agree with it, but if you can support it and you do it in an intelligent way, people are going to respect that. Number eight was listening without talking. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because... I wrote, this is me. I'm like, this is, this is all me. Or John. <laughs> John hates silence. I do hate He tries. Silence. He tries. He tries. He can't do it. You, you know, so <laughs> there's, but this, this was a little different, though, because this essentially said, you don't have to talk as soon as the other person's finished, that if you are, if you're normally somebody who's very talkative, that maybe just reverse, you know, reverse the roles one time and just listen and ask more questions to somebody else and let them talk about themselves. You're good at that. But, but I learned a lesson from you on this, which is, so when, when my agency would present Tim with creative when he was at Subaru, um, rarely did you or any other executive in that room speak during the presentation. Maybe you would say, can we possibly use this vehicle instead of that vehicle? Or what's our new color line? Or, or what, was, what are some of the new, the hero color? A hero color of a car is the car they use most for photography and TV commercials. Marketing purposes, for yeah. Marketing, yeah. But Tim would listen to the entire presentation, pause, and then begin to ask systematic questions. I want to go back to this one. I like this idea. And I remember you said it's not in my nature to do that because ad guys, we just got to talk. <laughs> We're selling. <laughs> We're yeah. selling. But well, I had to learn that, too. And I learned that from Tim and from Karen. To, they said, let the agency present everything. Let them get their point of view out. Let them give their reasoning for why they've they've done what they've Shows done it, yeah. and then you can have the discussion but it, it, it it's it's amazing skill when it worked quite well next one is working with someone you don't like we've all dealt with this problem um and there's many many ways around you can deal with a bossy coworker by telling the person that you're busy with working on something uh your boss assigned you with something and then ignoring the person if they pop up again i don't know about that one or you could deal with a loud coworker by asking politely for the person to keep it down in these cases that they gave this is not in my opinion working with someone you don't like this was working with someone who might be irritating, but I right. could like them. Right? And I put a side note here for me. You know, one of our guests that we have on um, quite frequently is Kelly McDonald. Yep. And uh, she's a renowned business and career uh, speaker, as well as having four books out about working with people not like you or whatever. And she, one of the last times she visited with us, she said, you know, we're talking about diversity in the workplace and inclusion and all those sort of things where people are different. She said, you don't have to like everybody you work with. You don't have to be their friend. You don't have to socialize with them, but you have to get along. And I looked at it that way of saying, just learn how to get along with somebody and manage it. Yeah. You don't have to like them. They don't have to be your best friend. You don't have to share but intimate you have to details. Work with them. But you have to work yeah. with them. So just, just handle it that way. The, um, then the, the article does a switch here, and it says, after they go through these things that we should master at 50, it says, then there are skills that hopefully you mastered well before <laughs> before the and, they, 50, and yeah. they actually said, for, hopefully you learn these things before you're 40. And the first one was negotiating. And I think that's, you know, negotiation is a difficult thing, I think. Oh, boy. Is it ever. Because it depends. Whether, are you negotiating salary? Is it ever. Are you negotiating time off? Yeah. Are you negotiating when you're going to go somewhere or take a trip? 
you have we all negotiate every day, right? You negotiate yeah. with your husband, your partner, your yeah. spouse, whatever. How are you with negotiating? I've gotten better. I've gotten better, and I've gotten better because I've often have you as a teammate. So. When, when me and Tim work with a new sponsor or a client or a consulting gig, we hear the same thing coming out of the, the client, and then we quarterback the game later, and then we'll play this game of what, what number do you want? And Tim will say, well, in my experience, when I was presented with this stuff, here's the number. And I'm like, well, when I was giving those numbers, here, and we usually do nail it, but yeah. I'm not sure that I... I got better at it when I was a freelancer, but it's hard. It's really hard. My favorite one, and you probably heard, well, I don't think people, and I'm not going to go into the dirty details, but you know where I'm going. John and I and our, our attorney were going to negotiate a contract. <laughs> and a very, very, very senior. well-known senior person at this media organization who's, you know, quoted in Hollywood Reporter and everything else is sitting there in a bit of a smacked ass. And very puffed up and whatever, and there was self-important, self-important, very self. All of these senior-level people from the organization there, and our attorney and you and I, we're going to negotiate this new contract, and we were asking for some very minor things, but specific things. And as soon as the meeting started, the guy was late that was coming in, and then he decided he was going to control the meeting. But John says, "Oh no, John's going to control the meeting." And these two went sparring at each other. At one point, John says to the guy, have you listened to the content on your programming? If I gave you, and John does this with his hand, a nickel, like he <laughs> drops it. Uh, he goes, if I gave you another nickel, you'd make five cents more this weekend than you did last weekend. <laughs> I and paid so, no attention to the rest of the room no! either. <laughs> and the, Lee is kicking me under, like we're all looking and all these other people are looking around and you're going back and forth with this guy. We leave. And we're in the elevator, you're like, well, how'd you think it went? <laughs> and Lee just looks at you and says, we're going to talk when we get out of here. So we go to the restaurant, and, and Lee is looking at me, and he just says, John, give me the phone number for their attorney. I'm going to have to handle this. <laughs> and he goes, I'm going to have to go back in and do this one-on-one. -on -one. Thankfully, Lee went in and did, got a great, got a great, great deal. deal for us. But we walked out of there with no deal. <laughs> we won. Me thinking we had the best deal in the world. How'd it go? I think it went real well. If I gave you a nickel. Yeah, and it was like you did that nickel. with a face, like dropped it. If I gave you a nickel, that'd be five cents more this weekend that you'd earn than you did last weekend. Oh, boy. <laughs> Toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hollywood royalty. Still one of my favorites. And it was world famous around the corporation there, too. They do that meeting for years to come. People are like, oh, oh. <laughs> All right, What's so, number two? <laughs> uh, on to things you should have mastered. We're going through a list of skills to master by the time you're 50, and now we're in the back end of the list of things you should have mastered probably by the time you're 40. Agree with this one 100%. Establishing a regular sleep schedule. I can't say this enough. I don't have a TV in my bedroom. I can't do that. Love a TV in the bedroom. We barely have. I have one little bedside light that I could use for reading, but go in, you crash. You, well, basically, I'm in bed by like 11:15, and now I'm up at seven, 6:30 to seven, and seven. I'm I'm not exactly on full thrusters, but by 7:15, I'm pretty much there. But I try to do that, and I think that even and they say something. I thought this was interesting. They said, "Don't hit the snooze button," yeah. and if you do. Do it only to get up and do something like meditate or who knows. And what. even on the weekends, you should get up at the yeah. same time, which yeah. some people don't do. Number three is very simple making small talk at parties. We yeah. all know that that's important. You have to make small talk, so just be aware of it and pretend. I always use the Tim Russett rule, which we've talked about here many times. Tim Russett always said if there was a party he went to or an event he went to, he didn't want to be at, the only way you'd get through it is to pretend it's the only place you want to be, yeah. and it makes things go quicker, and uh, you become life of the party. Now, another one, four. It's funny, the sleep one and this one falls in my lap. Finding and sticking to an exercise routine you enjoy. Cannot agree with this more. And this is something I had to face in my late 30s, I would say. You know, I used to love going to the gym. I liked working out. I did group classes. I love cycling. But uh, at some point, there had to be a purpose to this. Yeah. And that's and Tim was the one who said this to me. We were on a Loveland Pass. We were going to the, uh, the, the Connell Divide. Yep. Yeah. And Tim said, what are you doing with all this? You know, you ride your bike, you do it. What, 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 what are you doing with it? And then you gave me the idea to, to do European trips or to do century rides. Yeah. And then you have goals. You walk into the gym. And, and so as long as your fitness goals have a, a point, you're, and I just do exercise, but don't just do it. Do it something you like and do something that is motivating you and moving you forward. The, uh, the fifth one, and this is things to, to hopefully you've mastered by the time you're 40, is uh, finding your career s sweet spot. 
sweet spot, spot. your yeah. career sweet spot. And essentially that means finding something you're good at, something you love, and something that obviously gives value. Easier said than done. Sometimes people get into positions and maybe... And sometimes a job's a job. Job's a job. So you know, that, and that's, that's, that's nice. And the sweet spot there may be putting bread on the table. Right. <laughs> it's nice to find a sweet spot, but it's sometimes a little bit... Uh, Maybe unrealistic at times. This next one does not require us to say too much of anything, saving for retirement. And in fact, if there is anything to say on this score, it's two things. Do it and figure out your balance. And the sooner the better. And the sooner the better. Is it 6% of what you're earning? Is it 8 or 10? But commit to something and start putting some money away because you will be amazed that if you make it to 60, <laughs> it's, you're going to have a, you know, it's going to be important. When I first started at, at um, in corporate America, I didn't do it for three or four years, and I still regret not doing it eh. three or four years, but I couldn't feed a cat. So <laughs> and I'm eating 23% Mueller's pasta. <laughs> I know, and then when the macaroni and cheese was on sale, we were buying that stuff. Cents. Yeah, there you go. Number seven is investing in relationships. And it, um, it, it this really just, of, of course, we all have great relationships um, with people or some relationships that, that come and go out of your life. They also talk about balance, and John's mentioned balance before, about spending time with loved ones or... And kids, or, children. Or children. And it says quality of relationships are much more meaningful than quantity. Like that one. Here's one that does not require too much explanation either. And it's the hardest thing in the world to master, worse than negotiating, saying no to people. Yep. There's, there are some things you can never have back in your life, your time, your health, your virtue, or your skill set. And saying no is an important way of keeping those things in your court, but it's a hard one to do. But sometimes you know when you have to say no, but right. practice saying and no. Saying no doesn't mean you're a bad person no. or that you're disagreeable. No. If you do it correctly, it's, it's a good thing to learn. Number nine, I actually used the picture of my home. <laughs> at, I didn't see this yet. Down at, down at the beach. Keeping a clutter-free home. Yeah, this is That's important. the kitchen, John. Yeah. Oh, like I love, hey, yeah, this, the new kitchen looks great, by the way. Well, and that's not so kitchen. new. You painted the cabinets. Painted it. Yeah. yeah, so that's the kitchen. Clutter-free, that's the way somebody likes it that lives there. So, um, <laughs> that might not be Tim. <laughs> they say a way to get rid of clutter is to keep things that only spark joy. You know, there's that book by Marie Kondo. She's a Japanese woman. The Life of Changing magic of the life-changing magic of tidying up and she picks up something and says does it bring me joy and if it doesn't you get rid of it you know what i'd be a lot of stuff in my house i'd agree with that i completely I, I, that. I agree with good. that down to the point of the purchase of the item very good so any item over a certain amount of money i try to invoke the 24-hour rule if i could live without it for 24 hours i really don't need it you know okay. uh and i love clutter free clutter free oh, it's easier to clean i just feel easier like easier to move easier to move <laughs> You should move. Uh, big one for me, and I think for uh, Tim as well, practice hobbies. Yep. Uh, my hobby happens to be animation. Um, I used to put cycling in there, but that's an exercise thing. But I love animation. It takes me away from the day-to-day, -day, and yet it informs my business life in really cool ways. So I say, yes, that's a good thing you should be doing. Have a hobby. And number 11 was making new friends. And so this kind of is counter to the one we talked before about investing relationships. But this is making new friends. And they said it's important to be part of a community. So whether you're meeting some people, if you move to a new city, uh, people that may have similar interests or people that... Um, that do things like you or that you have maybe you're join a book club or something but they said one way to get yourself to meet some newer people at an older age is maybe you tell them something that makes yourself slightly vulnerable and then you feel like you're sharing with somebody and you start creating a relationship and then i added a 12th one john did you see it no there? i don't i don't have that on my i printed this out, last, printed out last night, night. yeah That's so why. and then there's a focus group one which you'll see in our book coming out someday <laughs> what is that one number you should master this by time you're 40 and way before wear clean underwear Oh, I saw that in the deck. You know, clean underwear is really important. Very important. I got, you know, Always wear clean underwear. Quick little story. When I owned my first ad agency, we were on the second floor of a building down on 6th Avenue, and my business partner had ears of a dog, and he heard something going on outside. It was a police <laughs> chase. The cruisers go up 6th Avenue. He runs out of the building, comes back, and says, there's been a chase, and there's been a crash at the fire station up on Houston. So we run up the block. Just as we get there, the paramedics are pulling the driver of the escape vehicle out of the car, and they're cutting off his jeans, and he's wearing gold lame briefs, and he's got a heart on. <laughs> so two things. My 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 old business partner. Do you have summer penis? My old my old business partner says, 
he says, he goes, ah, oh, that hard on, that's, that's natural when the body's in trauma. Don't even pay attention to that. Then he goes, but those gold briefs, someone let him out of the house? Like he didn't care about the hard on, but he did care about the gold lame briefs. So always wear clean underwear. Always wear clean underwear. And I made that mistake once too, but we'll have to tell that story another time. <laughs> I love that story. That's the executive washroom. Folks, for the future, it's the executive washroom story. That's the one, right? You want to hear it because it's going to no, take no, no, probably a little more time than we, we have. we got to save that today. one. So, yeah. So, if you want to hear it, let us know, and I'll tell you about it. <laughs> it was mortified. It's great. Wear clean underwear. Good story. Wear clean underwear. All right. That was uh, Skills to Master by 50, Skills You Should Have Mastered by 40 or 50. Uh, thanks for joining us today, everybody. Thank you, Garrett and John, ore our choreographer. Tim wants to steal. Did we get? Did we get a? Did we get a? No. Oh, the verdict. The verdict is the it verdict. could be gingerbread. Mm, yeah. no, no one's I'm a not a gingerbread fan. John, did you yeah. like them? No. Eh, it wasn't really too much. Eh, of it's, it's, eh, eh. No. I, I it's might not even. Good, I, I might not even eat them, but we'll leave them. According to the 50 other people that are coming through today, they're going to eat them. Good. They do smell. Good? I don't know. <laughs> they do smell, though. So thanks for joining us today. We want to thank Deep Discount for being a partner of ours here on the Focus Group. Uh, remember, there is a code that you can use for the month of August, FG15. Uh, it can't be, it's a one-time use code. It can't be used on video games or accessories, but everything else. And sometimes if you pair that with free shipping, you're going to get a lot of money saved. Visit focusgroupradio.com, click on the Deep Discount logo, start shopping. Remember, FG15. And a big thank you to Volkswagen Group of America. Uh, currently, I think Tiguan is doing fantastic. I saw some great lease prices on yes. that. Atlas is their, their larger vehicle. You should check out either car if you're in the market for that. I personally love my wagon, uh, all-track sport wagon. I've seen more in the wild lately than you do. More in the wild. <laughs> I'm in Philly. You know, and there's nothing that pleases me more than hitting the gas and going by an Outback. That car's got, and it, listen, the gas mileage, my, I don't know, you, have you been checking yours? I'm up close 32. to 38. There, oh, I'm you getting 38 miles per gallon. You're getting 38? I put it on that um, adaptive cruise control. So do I, but 30. You gotta look at it, babe. Hit zero when you leave. The Taconic Parkway is up. You're flat, right? It's mostly. It's Delaware. Okay, it's flat. The land got ironed. <laughs> All right. Everybody, don't text and drive, arrive alive, and tune in next week. Thank you. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash, formerly on Sirius XM Satellite Radio and now accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.